Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we are going to be discussing a topic that I've covered numerous times with many, many different clients, and that is performing a Chinese 6040 CNC retrofit. Um, whether you're running the Chinese 6040 translated to 600 millimeters by 400 millimeters or uh, 3020, 3040, 6090, all of these different Chinese variables, all they basically specify is what the size constraint is of the system. That's how they've named them. Um, it, these retrofits are essentially all the same. Okay, here's a demo email. I get these literally now probably eight to nine times a week, and that is. Performing a CNC retrofit, this what this particular potential client, um, his name is Claude. He says, I bought a, C, a 6090 CNC off eBay. I'd like to set it up one of your controls, run Mach 4. I have the spindle running and can control it manually, no problem. Uh, I do want to hook up for the Z-axis touch-off plate and one hookup for the fourth axis, which hopefully someday down the road I will get to use. I was thinking about running uh, your 600-ounce motors for the X and Y, but not sure if I would need it for the Z. But someday I do plan on at least some aluminum. I was looking at, and then he goes into detail about letting me know about what system he was looking at. Now, again, I must have done literally about 500 of these retrofits in the last five years easily, very easily. Um, that being said, there's a lot of detail that goes into performing a retrofit, and it seems to be some misconception that I get emails like this where they're brief. They're not really in detail of telling me certain details that I need to know. So it makes it kind of hard to always assess the situation and say, okay, this is the best package for you. But I'm going to break it down in this video as best as possible. So hopefully anyone reviewing this video who's serious is going to watch it to the end because there's a lot to learn here about these smaller chassis retrofits where most guys feel that a smaller chassis is a lot cheaper in performing a retrofit. Well, that can be in some cases, but in most cases what you'll find is that the more custom work custom um, accessories we want added to the chassis, custom features we want added to the chassis. No chassis is the same, generally speaking. Most clients want specific features for themselves, like you just heard on, on this email, or they want the expandability options in the future for that. That being said, when the word custom comes in, and I've said this numerous times to past clients, I've said it to potential clients, the word custom translates to cash in any genre of anything. Okay, so when we start talking about doing custom work or rewiring or, you know, I want this done, I want that done, okay, just keep in mind your budget goes up every time we start talking about that, okay? And I say that openly because a lot of guys don't quantify the entire retrofit they're looking at. They quantify purchasing the electronics. <clears throat> what they don't quantify, and this, this leads to a lot of problems in the genre, is the fact that when you buy electronics, you're buying the support that goes with the electronics, which should be included. If you're not getting the support, then look at the dollar amount you're spending on the electronics. But in that case, don't be upset. If you're paying $1,000 for a CNC chassis, let's go right here and see. We're paying a grand for a 6040, okay? Paying $1,200 for a 6040 and you don't get support, how do you have the right to be upset? You don't. You can't be that naive to think for $1,200 you're going to get a level of support with this that even makes sense when you can't even build the chassis in the U.S. buying the aluminum typically for that kind of parts or excuse me that kind of investment on top of doing the machining and everything else. It, guys, we have to be realistic in what we're looking at. So whether you decide later on and you will figure it out at some point, you buy this chassis, you're going to say, I want something better in terms of controllability as far as stability, you're going to look at it's time for retrofit. None of the cables with these units are shielded. Uh, none of the, uh, the Chinese has done a really great job making all of these uh, enclosures for their electronics look clean. They put the VFD digital interface in there along with the VFD, which is a complete no-no because a metal enclosure surrounding the VFD, and I've said this many times, translates to a Faraday cage trapping in the EMI. So basically you're just surrounding all of your electronics with EMI. Okay, and our drives are working on the step and direction signals, which are very low voltage, which are very susceptible to EMI interference. And guess what? It's hit and miss on how accurate your system is. I have certain clients that say their systems run great. I have other systems that other clients that say, oh, well, I can run two hours and then the system's all over the place. You decide which way you want to go with that. But overall, be realistic. First thing to always consider with this actual retrofit or even purchase is the fact that for 1200 bucks. 
you are basically buying a chassis. If you get any electronics, consider it a gift because you're not going to get much support with that. A lot of the, uh, the literature that comes with this unit, if any, are very poorly written. You're not going to find, you know, a lot of Mandarin translation into English. And these are things to consider. These are things that you must understand. You want to save the money. You think you're saving the money. You're really not. Most of the time you're shooting yourself in the foot. And then I get told, well, I'm buying the system because it's a hobby. Okay, let's discuss this very carefully and concisely. Okay, there is no such thing as a robot that's a hobby. Hobby in CNC translates to one three-letter word, toy. Okay, if you consider what you're buying a toy, and when I say a toy, you could care less if a circle is round. You could care less if you go to drill a hole and it's off by, you know, whatever arbitrary amount. You're okay with that. You're okay with lack of stability. You're okay with that. Then you are buying a hobby slash toy machine. Okay, then you're okay with it. A machine that you want stability with, a machine that you want accuracy with, a machine that you can get calibrated to under a thousandth of an inch, whether you want to or not, but have the ability to, that is a CNC robot, okay? And that is not considered a hobby machine, okay? And I feel that there has been a really vast misconception in this field, as long as I've done videos, as long as I've seen all these new systems hit the market where people are coming up with this term hobby. Hobby is in the sense of the end user, OK, if you are not using your machine to explicitly earn a living or explicitly make a product to resell, then the term to use is recreational use. It is not a hobby machine. OK, it's a recreational use unit and you are an enthusiast is what you are. OK, once you start producing anything and somebody sees what you've produced and odds are they will and I've said this in past videos many of you have heard it that they'll say hey you know where did you get that well I made it oh, well, how much you want for it can you make me one all of a sudden there's a business model and it happens all the time now whether or not you do it full time that's up to you whether or not you understand the marketing capability and understand all the facets that go into small business that's up to you I've helped many clients with those areas and I'm glad to do that um, I do offer consultation for that so as you guys design your robot, your particular robot for your applications, keep in mind there is no such thing when you come to me and say you want a hobby machine that that's going to somehow manipulate the pricing. It doesn't work that way because in the end, what you expect me to produce is a robot and that's exactly what I'm doing. Even though I'm not building your chassis, remember the electronics are what make the chassis do what you want it to. So when you say to me, Vin, I want you to produce a, uh, a hobby type uh, electronics, what I look at is what you're really telling me is you want me to produce ultra cheap electronics that are stupid accurate. <laughs> okay. And when we say stupid accurate, I mean extremely accurate. So let's be real. There is no such thing as hobby grade. All of my electronics are made at the same capacity from selling to Boeing, who's using a G540 system, or I'm selling to you. I'm doing it in the capacity that that unit, when calibrated properly with the proper instruments, will give you a, the performance of a CNC robot. Now, again, this is a much smaller scale CNC robot. However, it is still a very, very, very capable CNC robot. And I say that explicitly because this misconception that you need to buy a huge robot to make a lot of money, and I've said this in previous videos, is complete garbage. The end user's creativity and understanding of being an entrepreneur is what dictates how much money these robots can make. You take that into uh, an idea, a carpenter, for instance, who's worrying about making signs is not going to be near as lucrative as a dentist producing teeth. Why? I don't think I need to explain that. So we have to look at this from this perspective, okay? Substrates you're using dictate also value of what you're creating. Some, a sign made out of aluminum is totally different in value than a sign made out of wood under most circumstances, unless you're using some exotic substrate or exotic, uh, all types of exotic end mills and things. I mean, there's a lot of different variables that go into this. Overall, though, the bottom line is, is that with all these variables, that is why explicit details in an email message I really look for because it tells me who I'm dealing with. It tells me what level they're at in terms of how serious they are about getting what they're trying to get accomplished. When I get brief emails, I can only give a brief response. Thank God I've done this long enough to where I can read out a lot of where you guys are going.
So much so, you see the length of this email. Now I'm going to show you the length of my reply email. Okay, These are what my standardized reply email is for that type of chassis. And this is just covering the retrofit. So you can see here, I've already got a copy and paste model set. That tells you how often I do this. Okay, And I'm covering some things he didn't even discuss. I say, hey, and of course I'll put the client's name. Thank you for your support. Okay, then you have some choice on how you'd like to control the system. You can either use a stock parallel port, which would require a computer running Windows XP 32-bit or Windows Vista 32-bit operating systems and a desktop PC with a parallel port. Now, let's break this response down very carefully. If you're going to be running a Windows XP 32-bit or Windows Vista 32-bit operating system, most likely you use an archaic PC because not many modern PCs that I know of, actually I don't know any, that actually facilitate using a parallel port. They went out in like the mid-90s, guys. Okay, The older the neurological center of your CNC system, which would be your computer, you're going to most likely in, have some inclusive problems. And I don't even care if you're using the latest motion controllers like a UC100 or Ethernet Smooth Stepper. The bottom line is always modify first what computer you're running. I've had weird instances where I'll have a guy that'll have... For some reason, you know, like a Bridgeport mill, a full Bridgeport mill, and he'll for some reason tell me he's running, you know, a 1980s control system using a 486 computer with floppy disks. I mean, and then he's worried about where his business is going to be. And it's like, okay, but we have to be a little more competent than that. I mean, we cannot sit there and be so foolish to believe that we're going to use archaic technology and if God forbid something fails, his business model's done. Okay, I mean, it's totally done. We need to be proactive, not reactive. And that's where business, that's what separates, I feel, true business owners and real robot facilitators, so to speak, from the guys who are, once again, just casually going into this and, you know, they never prepare for anything. No extra end mills, no coolant. You see guys using WD-40 all the time with the intermittent spritz instead of getting a cooling system. We need to look at this as you're going to do it right the first time and it will pay dividends with this type of investment. That being said, your computer, once again, is something you need to invest in wholeheartedly. I recommend a multi-core processor modernized. i5, i7 Intel is my favorite. You're more than welcome to go with an AMD model if you decide. It's like a Ford or Chevy uh, dispute. The big thing here is, is that we stay with a modern PC. Now, when it comes to memory in that computer, I recommend no less than 16 gigs. First of all, memory is very cheap. Second of all, the computer is very cheap. Even buying a modern system, i5, i7, AMD multi-core processor. The big thing here is, is that we stay with modern technology. It will make your overall support structure on your system much easier. Windows XP is no longer supported for God knows how long from Microsoft, nor is Windows Vista. So using these operating systems on older PCs is simply an excuse to claim not having the money. Yet I have clients that will always want to kind of... Uh, put the cart before the horse, so to speak, and say, let me re-upgrade all of my electronics, but I'll use a computer from, the, from you know, 1985. That's ridiculous. So, again, you got an old computer? Upgrade that first. Then we'll worry about doing your electronics because, realistically, the new computer, again, is the whole neurological center of CNC. Okay? Right now, when you think about it, computer numerically controlled, again, is what CNC stands for. So when we look at that and we break it down, computer is right there. It's the first, we're actually going through and looking at that component first. So we need to analyze this in that retrospect as far as performing any type of retrofit. I break down right here, then I go into, you could also go with a UC100 USB motion controller or Ethernet smooth stepper. Either the UC100 USB motion controller or ESS motion controller will allow you to convert the stock DB25 parallel port on the G540 into USB or Ethernet input. This will allow you to use Windows 7 through 10 operating systems in either 32-bit or 64-bit formats. It will also allow the options of using laptops as well as desktop computers. Now, I'm going to go into explicit detail here, guys. For those of you who are unfamiliar with using modern-day motion controllers, excuse me one sec, let me just grab a drink. Okay, when you use a USB motion controller, whether it be a UC100, 
whether it be a Chinese UC100, they've got those out knockoffs, whether it be a, a, a USB breakout board, you are running a motion controller that symbolizes using 5 volts to sustain signal reception. Okay, so whether it's sending signals, receiving signals, it's using 5 volts. Your computer can only sustain that 5 volt actual voltage at a certain level, meaning it will fluctuate up, it will fluctuate down. This is one variable with USB that can cause what's known as sync errors, disconnect errors, and it goes on and on. That's one variable. Next variable is grounding. Your PC may not be properly grounded. I don't care if it's a desktop. And I'm going to paint you another little picture. Laptops are free-floating grounds. Why? Because they're portable. Where are they connected to a wall unless they're plugged into an outlet? And even if they are plugged into an outlet, it doesn't guarantee it's properly grounded. Okay, there are too many variables with PCs in terms of manufacturing, in terms of where they're at with uh, being assembled. Some, a lot of people now build their own computers. I know I do, and it's very difficult to get a system totally grounded. You might be using a high-end power supply from, you know, Cooler Master, and it may not be properly grounded in terms of grounding the motherboard and every other component that goes with that. This is inherent of these systems. So when you think about that. If you have that potential for instability using USB, keep that in mind. A lot of guys don't know that. UC100 is a great controller, pending all of these variables are stable. If you find that your chassis is not properly grounded, when I say chassis, I mean, first of all, the CNC chassis, and second of all, your computer not being properly grounded, you can get what's known as a sync error. You don't know what it is? Look it up. Okay? When you go with Ethernet control, that sync error is eliminated because we're dealing with CAT7 transpiring of signals, so we have better stability. The UC100 or any USB controller is limited as well to a 15-foot cable. And that's why, if you notice, I only sell a double-shielded cable for the unit that's in a length of 15 foot because that is the maximum length that can be supported when we're using a 5 volt signal. We're using a very low voltage, and with very low voltage comes the susceptibility of EMI. So... Remember, we're dealing with multiple step and direction pulses all at once. And that all goes through that cable, and it all goes through the controller, and one misstep or direction pulse, and all of a sudden, you've got instability. So if you want a stable, or I should say the most stable system, your best bet is always to look at the dollar amount. In CNC, 9 out of 10 times, it's going to be what you pay is what's going to dictate how stable the system is. The Ethernet Smooth Step Return Key solution that I came out with is the most stable platform you can get with the most expandability. The UC100, however, is still going to give you the Windows 7 through 10 operating system support and using a modern computer. The issue is, is that you're using a 5-volt signal. So unless you properly ground that chassis, and even though I'm saying this about a USB system, all CNC chassis should be properly grounded. You need to go through the entire process. I've, I've outlined it numerous times. I have well over 240 videos on my channel right now. Okay, and consider how many videos I have in compare of subs actual subscribers is very low because I'm not doing FaceTime videos. I'm not doing, hey, here's a product or in, in terms of doing machining things that you see all over the place. I'm trying to make it so you guys have a, a, a direct reference to learn from and use and pull as needed. And I think I've done a, a pretty decent job because, again, I get a lot of guys always telling me how wonderful it is to be able to go on there, watch a video, and most of the time pick it up really quickly. And that I'm, I'm really excited about. The big thing here is that you guys understand grounding on any system – whether it be a CNC router, a CNC mill, and of course a CNC plasma system, it is not optional. It is mandatory. 3 ohm or underrating is, is where that chassis should be at measuring anywhere on that chassis. Okay, if you get a 3 ohm rating on one end and get a 10 ohm at the other end or a 5 ohm, you already know something's amiss. Drop the ohms. Okay, that's the first step. Second step is if you're going to use a USB motion control, you want to make sure that your computer is properly grounded. I would definitely use the multimeter on that as well. Go through it and test it. You don't have to buy anything to test that first. You have to be aware of it. And that's why I'm trying to educate you. So when you facilitate again, what's this video worth? It's worth a lot of money because I'm giving you a lot of information that CNC Drive doesn't disclose on their website. No, you, no actual 
uh, disclosure of any kind I've ever seen, except on Warp 9 site, who manufactures the ESS, and they even discuss the potential for EMI. And if you notice, on my UC100, I sell it for 165. You can see the price down here. Um, I sell that unit for 165 because I'm the only vendor who sells it with an EMI filter. Not only a DB25 EMI filter that filters out where the unit plugs into the controller, meaning the G540, but also the extended cable with an actual ferrite installed, and it is properly double shielded. That is why I sell it that way. And again, this way we try to start fresh, and then we hope that you know you guys understand. The principles of going through and grounding the system. If you don't understand, ask before you buy. It's very simple. And that's why I'm covering this video. I hope all of you are watching this to the end because there's a lot of information here covered and it will save you a lot of headache. So again, you go with the UC100. You know those variables. We'll go with the ESS, same thing. Table needs to be grounded. Once again, CNC mill, CNC router, CNC plasma table, all grounding process the same. Now, the plasma system, of course, requires the most extensive grounding. However, the principles can carry over into any genre, whether it be mill, router, or plasma. So, again, keep that in mind. If we go with the ESS, I'm describing this right here. The ESS, however, will allow you the ability to control up to six axis on top of that, as well as have the Ethernet cable lengths of up to 100 foot from the controller. I discussed the six axis expansion option in this video. I give you a link. This offers the most stable signals as it relies on a CAT7 cable for transmission. I cover that. Again, ESS is more money. It gives you the availability to go five and six up to eight axis. Many of you have already seen my video on the eight axis system that I've, I've released. It's the only eight axis I know of in the world that's, that actually utilizes dual G540s. Um, and again, very simple configuration, and it allows the most expandability currently available if you guys are doing a, more, uh, a smaller scale civilian-based system. This is something to keep in mind. If you're looking at expandability, if you're looking at maximum signal reception, if you want to look at overall, I guess, productivity due to the fact that you have all those variables, the ESS turnkey solution is the unit for you. Now, that being said, I did break down here uh, the UC100's USB cable is limited to 15 foot, like I said. It's, uh, it uses only 5 volt from the PC's USB input for signal production. The cost of the UC100 USB motion control is 165 and the ESS is 310 These prices are additional to the cost of the system below. Now, again, everything you're going to see here is a la carte. And why is that? Because I have clients that, once again, demand for custom components. Everything is custom built. And they're absolutely right. Why buy something you don't need? You may have it already. So... Keep that in mind as we go through this. Very few prices are disclosed because, again, with a custom system, until I know exactly what we're dealing with, these are the things that you encounter. Now, something else that was not brought up in that email that we covered. You'll require my new stainless adjustable motor mount kit here with an overview video discussing how simple it is to use. Why would he require a stainless adjustable motor mount kit at all? Well, let's think about it. If we go back to his email... And he's requesting to use 600 ounce motors. There's this misconception, and I don't know exactly where it started or where it came from or pretty much anything about it, but there's this misconception that we just bolt on motors and immediately everything fits. Now, let me be very clear. The motors themselves, as far as mounting spacing, will always be different. The only thing that fits is the bolt pattern, which is NEMA 23, NEMA 24. They're the same. They're backwards compatible. NEMA 34 is larger than NEMA 23 or 24, and then there's NEMA 42, and so on and so forth. 98% of you will be using uh, NEMA 23, NEMA 24. My 600 ounce or NEMA 24, the only difference between NEMA 23 and that variable is the fact that the chassis on the motor is extended in length, therefore we use a larger coil and we anticipate larger torque. Now, that being said, in doing so, we have to also understand that, once again, my shaft length is going to throw off the entire equilibrium of your robot when you go to mount it because your motor mounts are not designed around my motors. So the spacing there is incorrect. What does that mean? That means that when you go to get these motors in the house, yes, they'll mount up to your bolts, your bolt pattern, but what they won't do is allow for proper clearance of your motor coupler to properly engage the ball screw on top of engaging on the motor end. So what you typically will have is friction on both the chassis end of the CNC and friction on the motor end. Now, if many of you see how fluent I'm speaking of this. That should tell you just how in-depth I've done these retrofits. 
Okay, that should tell you really, really clear. Either this guy is amazing at just calling stuff off. I don't have a script in front of me. I'm just telling you, this is what you're going to encounter. Now, that being said, when we come over here, and I've, I've actually uh, designed these new stainless steel adjustable motor mount kits. Many of you look at these products when I release them. And they can't. a lot of guys tell me they can't put in where do, where do these fit in. That's where these fit in out of, out of necessity. Okay? The mother invention steps in when we have necessity. And in this case, we have necessity because many of you are looking for a motor mount kit that's adjustable out of the hardest material possible that makes feasible sense, which would be 304 stainless. And that's what I've done here. And if you see here, control click link to follow the link if we want to go to it. Overall, if you do that, of course, using uh, Microsoft Word, it will take me there. I will put a link in the description below so we don't lose track of where we are. Um, overall, though, this allows you guys the quickest solution to use stackable spacers made out of 304 stainless so you have the maximum amount of rigidity and give you the proper spacing for your new motors this is required whenever you change the stock motors on the chassis now that being said do you have to change the stock motors well that's a good question we don't necessarily have to change the stock motors unless unless you plan on working with a specific substrate that requires that now all metal substrates are going to perform much better with a 600 ounce motor 600 ounce motor and i've got it right here just to cover that with you guys gonna get questions on this a lot let's bring it up see 600 ounce motor is 37 and a half inch pounds of torque so a 600 ounce inch motor translates 37 and a half inch pounds of torque that is massive guys that will mill steel that will mill virtually all metals uh, feed rates will have to be adjusted for every substrate of course but that gives you the open gamut now that being said when you step up to more horsepower in torque, we also have to upgrade all the components to support that. Okay, no different than you drop a big block Chevy and you know a Fiero, <laughs> you better upgrade that vehicle. Or you're going to have problems. Well, it's the same same instrument here. Where we have to look at this analytically and we have to work with precision to make sure that the robot we're creating is not only going to provide stability but provide the amount of durability required. So that being said. As we go through, we analyze everything. The stainless adjustable motor mounts is a must. After we get the stainless motor mount set and your spacing set, then we come down here and we select our new motor couplers, which is why, again, I carry three or four stainless zero backlash motor couplers. Any person who's using these motor couplers, I know any of my clients that are using them, and believe me, I have the production manager for Ford, a Ford facility, meaning the Ford motor car facility using them. These are the real deal, guys. These are the real deal. They're fire and forget. They are zero backlash. The most rigid couplers you will get. Um, and when I say that, you will notice a huge difference going from them aluminum accordion spring crap that ships with these systems. The Chinese can get away with that because the motors they typically use on a stock 6040 is about 150 ounce inches. You're jumping up to 600, okay? So when we do that, we're looking, what, 450 ounce inches? You're going like, what, four or five times the actual motor torque of what the stock motor is? Massive, massive difference. So again, we have to look at all this. So now you've got an upgrade here that has to be done on the motor mounts. Okay. Then we have another upgrade here on the amount of couplers you need. I need the sizes measured. And again I, again, I cover that. The motor couplers will also have to be changed to support the torque increase from my motors. I carry three or four stainless or backlash ones. I can supply once I know the ball screw diameter that engages your motors. These are not standardized. So I would need you to supply me the bore diameter required. Here's a look at them, and I send a link for that so you guys can review that and start taking the measurements. In order to take measurements for the required standoffs, I made a video tutorial. Please excuse the name using it as I made it for originally for another client. Again, I'm trying to save myself extra work because these videos, number one, they're long, but there's a reason they're long because we're covering all the details, and that's the difference. We're covering the details that many videos don't even discuss. You will find that out. Everything I'm saying is factually true in terms of every component is not an option. It's a must, and it makes a huge difference when we're all done. You're going to have one hell of a robot. So again, you go in with stainless motor mounts, extreme rigidity. We go with stainless... Uh, Ball screw, or excuse me, uh, zero backlash couplers, extreme rigidity. As we go through, now you already know the chassis is fine. 
that, that CNC 60, 40, 60, 90, 30, 20, 30, 40, whatever it is, all of those chassis are fine as rigidity. You're using an excellent ball screw system as far as transmission. But once we upgrade the electronics and then put the icing on the cake with more rigidity in our motor mounts, more rigidity with our motor couplers, all of that then transpires to that robot. So as we come over here, I'm going to bring up an area that comes up a lot. Just let me excuse myself one more time. I need a drink. Okay, you can see here, him like many other potential clients are saying, I, I do want to hook up for Z-axis touch-off plate and one hook up for the fourth axis. So we already know he's requesting some custom work to be done. Okay, um, The touch-off plate, you're definitely going to have to do if, if you want to do it for yourself in terms of you not using offsets to program in a specific substrate. Many of you do not realize, and or at least don't practice it, at least um, to my understanding, that you can program in Mach 3 the thickness of a substrate to have the z-axis always go to that specific thickness. Now, you automatically assume you need to do a touch-off on that substrate every single time. If you're using the same substrate over and over and over again, you can program in that thickness. If you're not, that's different. Then having that actual uh, touch plate may be beneficial. If, however, you per se have like three different substrates, you can still use offsets for all three of those different substrates in thickness and just program it in. Mach 3 will remember that as an offset as a GPS location that you're programming in the system. Okay, you're using your computer's memory in, in actual conjunction with Mach 3 to program in and articulate where you want those axes to go. You can definitely do that with the Z-axis. Many of you guys don't look at what's capable with the software and it's lack of knowledge, I feel, more than anything else. And when one guy does something online, a lot of guys copy what he does. The issue with that is if one guy jumps off a bridge because it seems normal, everybody else jumps off the bridge because they say it seems normal you got to be a little different and try things. If we don't try, we don't learn. The difference is if you make a mistake and you try, learn from it. And that's the difference. And when I say that, a lot of guys don't read. They'll tell me, oh, I read Mach 3 manual, and I can tell just by what they're coming back with, they didn't read it. Or if they did read it, they didn't interpret it correctly. That being said, you can see right here I break down, and this is a paragraph I'm going to skip, but I break down if a client is telling me they want switches installed. I don't recommend using physical switches. I've said this, I can't even remember how many videos. I've got now 240 plus online. I can't remember how many videos I said this in. And why I don't like physical switches is they all will eventually fail. They all will fail and they will eventually leave the machine unprotected. And I still have guys coming back to me and telling me that, oh, a switch never failed. I've had guys related to elevators. I've had guys tell me the most, I'm being honest, most ridiculous ass nine things when switches all will fail. They are an electronic piece of hardware. They are not infallible. They will fail. The question is, are you willing to play roulette and see when yours will? <laughs> Maybe it'll last forever. Maybe it won't. But I'm going to tell you this for a fact, whether or not you want to argue or disagree, that's totally up to you. I say before you disagree, you test it by using this link right here if you get this email and going to it and review my soft limits video and try to go past the soft limits in any capacity. And what you're going to find is you're going to be limited. The software holds you pinpoint accuracy to the exact location you are. You will never get that accuracy or repeatability with a physical switch. It will never click in the exact same location every single time. As an engineer, I can tell you this is fact. As an engineer, I can tell you that variables exist that make it mechanically impossible for that to occur. If you think you know better, by all means, go with it. I mean, what do I know? I mean, I've got 2,000 plus, I think 2,200 now in feedback, 100% on eBay, 1,000 followers on eBay, 7,000 plus followers now on YouTube, but I don't know what I'm talking about. I've sold to Boeing. I've sold to Applied Materials. I've built a system for Boeing. I've built a system for Applied Materials. I've built for Exxon. We go down this road, and I still have guys arguing with me. And I'm doing this as a profession, professionally, with full disclosure, full validation of this, openly online. I'm telling you right now, be careful.
and I say that openly, please be careful. A lot of the people that are disclosing using physical switches is because they are lack of knowledge of using and understanding what the capability of Mach 3 is, Mach 4 is, and of course UC CNC, which is uh, again a piece of software that came from CNC Drive. It's basically their motion control software, but overall, soft limits is not anything new. It's been around a long time, and if you implement them and learn them properly, it's amazing. It's amazing what you can do. As a matter of fact, I break it down here. The speed difference in this alone is easily 70% over typical switch method of having to bounce off your home switches first and then have the chassis move to the machining location you plan to start your job from. Think about trying this before investing in inputs. And when I say inputs, investing in additional inputs that are more of an option. Now, if you do want to go that route, I say, hey, go that route after you test why spend the money for me to install them or you to install them or whatever else without testing what I'm saying and see if you can do it? Because I can tell you right now, once you test it and see how simple it is, yes, you need a process. Yes, you may need to write something down to acquire the knowledge over time. But if you do it, you are going to see an amazing speed difference because all of those GPS locations are integrated then into the software and saved in computer's memory and you can just hit the button G55, G56, G57 and the machine goes right to the place you'd like the machine from. And of course soft limits will then of course act as end stops that will never fail. Pending, pending, you properly have soft limits set and of course pending that you understand what you're working with must be set up when I say properly set, I mean you must understand that the button for soft limits must be green and highlighted green, as in the video. The video tutorial takes you through everything. I still have guys message me and say they have trouble, and this it's usually because they're using hack software or they're using Chinese uh, Mach 3 registry patches and things. If you use a retail version of Mach 3 from Artsoft or from a legal vendor, and set up that software as I show in that video, you will get to truly see the power of soft limits. Over 900 people left likes, and I, I think now it's like, I don't know, 100,000 or so viewed the video. And what that tells me is out of 100,000 people, basically 900 people got it. Because why would they leave the like? Think about it. So what I'm telling you is try it. See? If you still want to pay for inputs, I'll gladly install them. Um, that being said, as we come up here, I break down, here's the basic retrofit you'll require, and I go through. When I say basic, this is basic. This is what you would require. Um, again, the only thing I would say that is actually added on here extra in this particular instance is because he's requesting 600 ounce. I always would give you the system without motors because it's truly up to you if you want to change your motors. You can use your stock motors pending, of course, they do not exceed 3.5 amp, which I have never encountered a 60-40 60, 90, 30, 20, 30, 40 ever exceed that amperage. So as long as it's three and a half amp or under, and the main reason it needs to be three and a half amps or under is due to the fact that we don't want to exceed what the G540 is able to actually distribute in amperage. That's peak amp, guys. RMS is always going to be about 2.7 amps, 70%. So overall, that's what you're looking at with that drive. And when you fa actually factor in what you're trying to do, when we look at a motor that's per se, if you're using stock motors and maybe they're 2 amp, you're still fine with that. You're only going to be looking, you know, what, 1.5, 1.7 amps overall is what you'll be running RMS. The big thing is, is that we have our resistor in place, and I get asked about this a lot. Why do we use resistors with the G540 on our motors? And the main reason we do is so that the drive will detect the resistor and limit the current at what we actually set the resistor in at the ohms rating we use. And I have a whole formula for that. It comes from Gecko. And then on top of that, I provide you that or I provide you the actual resistors because if you buy my motors, I incorporate them with them so you don't have any guesswork. The big thing is, is that it also allows the drive to enter what's known as idle current reduction mode. That allows the drive to reduce its current to 70% of max because when your system is no longer moving, we don't need to burn up the motors by just increasing heat. The misconception with steppers as well is that steppers, for some reason, guys always get them and they'll get their new system and they're like, man, the motors are really hot. 
motors are really hot because steppers are constantly drawing amps. They're always providing holding torque where an AC or DC or an AC motor may be on or off at a specific time. Typically, most guys only see uh, heat when the motor is on. Well, take it in this respect that a stepper motor, when it's used in a robotic application, is always on. It's always providing torque either going forward, aft, or providing holding torque, which means it's giving enough torque to where the axis can't move. So, again, we're always drawing amps, and the dissipation from the coil goes through the actual steel body, the metal body, and that's what we're looking at. We're looking at how it, dis it distributes that through the iron. So when you look at that and you facilitate where it's actually going to heat, that's why steppers get hot, okay? And it's very, very common. They get easily hot enough to cook an egg. I mean, you don't want them to, but they can definitely get that hot. I have a video on that as well from Keller Morgan. So again, things to keep in mind. So we see right here we've got the basic parameters of what will be included in either a DIY kit if you decide to build it or uh, the actual system itself if you decide that you would like me to build it. Now I come down here and I give you the breakdown of different formats. Total cost of the components above assembled in a turnkey system with 600 ounce motors is and again it depends on where your location is in the US. Total of the system and DIY kit form 600 ounce, 600 ounce motors you'll assemble is shipped. Um, and that's DIY kit form. Total cost components above assembled in the turnkey system and shipped in the U.S. without any motors. Total for the system DIY kit form without any motors you'll assemble and shipped. And then again, if you would like to swap out your stock motors to either 300 ounce inch or 600 ounce inch, uh, you can do that as well based on the substrates you're machining. But then you'll also require changing your motor mounts as your stock motor mounts won't support the length of my motor shifts. I covered that already, but again... Doing it in this format, I'm doing it basically in a recorded consultation. This is no different than I go over with many of you. I'm trying to do it so that I could knock as many birds off as one stone with this method because many of you, as you find the videos, hopefully you'll find this and, like I said, watch it to the end. If you're really serious about doing a retrofit on this system, you got a lot to learn here. So I'm telling you. It makes sense, and you can see here all the variables in which case you would be selecting different motors. Now, if you say, Ben, I'm working with wood right now, I'm making money, um, I might do aluminum later on. The question is, when do you want to spend the money? Meaning, eventually you're probably going to want bigger motors. If you make an ROI now and you're making money and the system's already paying for itself and you've got a little money to float it, I'd say invest in the bigger motors. If you don't, Keep making the money with the small motors, and when you're ready, then adjust it. The ROI is what should be based upon you investing more in your system. If the robot is producing what it needs to do and fulfilling its need and capacity, there is no need for you as any type of small business owner to invest. Now, you can argue that point. I have guys that will just go out and, you know, it, it, it's for some reason they're never happy in the sense that they always think there's something greener on the other side. In, your, in retrospect with a robot, the big thing is you want to make sure it's fulfilling its capacity. What did you buy it to do? Is it accomplishing it stably? Is it meeting your expertise and standards of what production needs are required? If it is, then don't, you don't need to upgrade anything. If it's not, then the best bet would be to really quantify where am I, how much am I making? Am I going to make any more money if I upgrade the motors? I'm not working with aluminum, but if I plan on working with aluminum, um, and I go to 600 ounce motors, what's my ROI going to be now? I mean, I can tell you right now, aluminum from wood, under most applications, you're going to make a huge difference in money. Especially I have clients that are dealing a lot in the firearms market. They'll do grips. They'll do, you know, different, uh, all kinds of different machining options for firearms. You are looking at a huge variable in money from going from wood to that application in that genre because, again, we're dealing with a different level of expertise. We're dealing with, you know, an entirely different market on top of entirely different substrates. Now, of course, you do encounter variables with costs invested in end mills and tooling, but I'm telling you, the money is an insane factor when you're looking at what it's capable of. The big thing here is, is what you plan on doing. So that's why I break this down into different motor sizes. Now, in this particular email, once again, he was very specific in what, and like many of you are, what motor size he wants to go with. So I break it down. And that's exactly what I'm doing over here is I'm breaking it down. I give him the choice. I do not include prices in this, and I get asked this a lot because I don't know locations, and there's different variables. And the main variable is this. How are you going to pay me? Let me explain. 
and I'll make this as cut and dry as possible. I get guys that will always message me, hey, will you give me a discount? Hey, I'm a subscriber on your channel. I've been subscribed for a while. I want a discount. Okay, um, I'll tell you what. Give me a discount. And what I mean to say is if you don't buy on eBay and you pay me direct through friends and family or you pay me direct through PayPal, guess what? You get a discount because then I'm not paying all the overhead right off the top. And I'll tell you another little thing that's going to really blow your mind or should be something to be, at least give you food for thought is that if you pay me direct through PayPal, you're instantly, instantly saving tax. Instantly. eBay is now charging tax on everything. And I can tell you right now, when you're doing a retrofit, you start doing the math on all this and you're easily looking at thousands of dollars, you break down the tax on that. So you've saved that right off the top just by paying me through PayPal. Now, once again, am I a guy that you can trust? Well, let's let's analyze this. 7,000 followers on eBay. 1,000 followers, or excuse me, 1,000 followers on eBay, 7,000 YouTube subscribers, 2,200 plus on eBay feedback at 100%. I would say you're probably okay. And I think many of you feel that way. I mean, let's be real. And I think that's really where it's at. I'm always willing to work with people, but by the same token, you work with me. Because I still have bills to pay too. And that's why, again, depending upon where you're located, I have a lot of clients internationally located. And they'll say, hey, you know, I don't want to pay this shipping. I had, as a matter of fact, I shipped to a client in Malaysia this week. And uh, it was a small order. And I think it was like $100 shipping to go to Malaysia. I'm in Florida, guys. You're crossing the globe for 100 bucks. I wouldn't complain about that. You know, in my eyes, he thought that was expensive. And then he said, well... I want to go even cheaper than the six to ten day shipping quote I gave him. And I'm like, okay, I didn't even know that you could go cheaper, to be quite honest with you. And I look, because I never had anyone ever say anything about that. I mean, like I said, a hundred bucks to cross the globe. I mean, Jesus, I'm in I'm just outside of Tampa. I know to drive to Pensacola, I probably spend at least sixty dollars in gas. So I mean, to me to pay a hundred dollars to cross the globe to go to Malaysia, I didn't think it was bad, but we actually got the shipping down. Uh, I think it was like another 20 or 30 bucks. And, you know, he felt that was a better deal. And again, I know many of you that are international will be paying VAT and different taxes. Um, for all my international orders, I prefer to go through eBay. And I'm going to tell you why. It's because eBay has what's known as a global shipping program where they offer the best insurance I've ever seen as far as no questions asked in terms of them when you make a claim, they handle everything. Um, and that makes it easier for both you, the client, and me, the seller. Because, again, as a vendor, I have to protect my investment, which is your investment. My money is your money. The difference is is that it's when you get your money and when you actually uh, hand it over to me, I have to make sure that everything you get is fulfilled at what I feel I would expect. And that means I try to mitigate as much risk on your end and my end as possible. That's my obligation as a vendor. Now, not everybody feels that way. I feel that way. And that's why I go that route. Now, that being said, eBay, using the global shipping program, does not disclose to me what the cost of shipping is because every location is different. So they base it on your specific area, your zip code, uh, whatever VAT taxes are in, in play. All of that comes into play. So keep that in mind when you're looking at this. As we come down where he's asking me again to add – uh, in his case, he's not asking switches. Uh, again, I throw this in there if the client is asking for switches because inputs are inputs, whether it's a switch or a touch plate. A touch plate is nothing more than a switch. The only difference is your contact point is your end mill. Um, overall, that's why I designed a new master edition enclosure. I offer two formats, one with all the components in terms of the relay and all of the switches and that. And then I also offer just the bare enclosure pre-milled to support all the options that the G540 has. And why did I do that? I did that because I was preemptively thinking that I still get many clients that say, hey, I don't care what you say, I want switches. Okay, well, guess what? You can go this route. And you'll pay this a flat rate rather than having me machine everything custom because, again, custom means more cash. I lower my workload. I lower your cost. I make more sales. This is business. And that's the way it's done and should be done. And that's exactly what I did. So in this particular instance where this potential client is asking me for a touch plate, then that's a switch. So we know, what would I do? I'd say, well, I can mill out the enclosure, but by the time I mill out a custom enclosure, he would pay basically the same as just milling it out for all options. Now, what does that mean to you? 
that means you've got the option later on to add whatever input you'd like because they're already done. So if you look at it, all the work is done. You're essentially paying the same price, and you're getting more for your money. There you go. That solves that problem. Now as we come down here, parts and labor costs for installing the switch ports with graphics is an additional blank. Here's a similar chassis completed for a past client for reference. And again, I send this, and you can see I'm sending all links, guys. These are all video links or product links. All product links have videos. Why am I doing that? Because there's no way in hell I can expect any novice to just get involved in this to say, I understand all this. There's a lot to understand. You can see I've got years and years and years of experience doing this. This is not a one-time thing. There's a lot of detail in these emails. And there's a reason I'm covering that. When you look at this and when you understand that, again, the parts and labor and cost for installing switch ports with graphics is an additional. Now, I just said something here. I said parts, labor... Uh, for switch ports as well as graphics. I'm the only vendor who includes custom graphics on all their systems. I use 3M8518 over laminate used by NASCAR. I use all professional gray materials. I use a printer that's an Epson P P7000 sure color. You want to look that up, it's five cran. Okay, uh, and that's, that's, that's what I paid for. It. So I can tell you right now, all of my stuff is pro, all of it. And that's what you're paying for. So when you say to me, well, why is this, you know, three to five hundred to install? Well, it's five, three to five hundred installed between the soldering, all the tools that I require to do it, all the knowledge I have to do it, all the transfer, the transpiring of that knowledge on graphics that are custom made to support your enclosure so that I can take my knowledge and give it to you. And it's always there in front of you when you want to service your system. What is that worth? What is that worth? Well, that's what it's worth. It's worth to me that. So I think it all makes logical sense. And when you break it down, like I said, weigh it. Go on other vendor sites. See if they're doing that. Go on all my videos and see. You see actual photo images of the components that you're working with. When you see the breakdown, hell, you can look at some of my wiring diagrams. I just did a video, I think, last week of IDS, the IDS system uh, wiring diagrams. You can see they're all real images. I mean, I'm showing you the actual images to make things as simple as possible. I'm not using engineering diagrams. And I'm doing that so that anybody can follow this. And that is going to take money and time because time is money and vice versa. So, again, this is what you're paying for. The other factor is support. All of this, everything you see here from this beginning stage of the, of the email all the way to the end, there's always going to be support included. As we come down, I even break down a spindle package. This is my most requested spindle package, and that would be a 2.2K spindle. This is a water-cooled option. And again, a lot of guys, when they talk about spindles, they don't realize if you're retrofitting a system, you should be looking at retrofitting at least the spindle cables of the actual uh, spindle that came with your system because none of those cables are double-shielded as they should be. So you're mitigate, you're actually got spewing EMI all over the place, and therefore that's why most of the time the symbol is the, the system is not stable. Um, that will generate the largest amount of EMI is the VFD. So again, when guys ask me about a spindle package that's all encompassing, that's what I'm offering here. Now I'm going to tell you something that a lot of guys don't know until you message me about a spindle. They'll say, Hey Vin, I'm looking for a certain size spindle. I don't see it in your store. Can you get it? First of all, I can get anything you want. The big thing here is, does it pay on my end? Because why am I going to carry inventory and make you pay for it? Meaning I have to raise my prices to carry more inventory. That's silly. So what I do is I order it based on requirement. First of all, it keeps my mitigation of space low. On the second hand, it also keeps your price low because I'm not carrying inventory. Okay, I'm not automation direct where I'm carrying, you know, 5,000 warehouse or five or six warehouses full of inventory that you're paying for. Yeah, they can lower certain prices because they got 16 million dollars in inventory sitting on their shelves. I don't work that way. I work a little more logical than that. Um, I also don't have 50 people working for me. So when you call and you speak to me and you say, hey, Vin, how did you design the system? I can answer that question. You're not talking to Joe Blow today, and then tomorrow you call back and you're speaking to Mike Blue. It, it, there's a total different disparity in what you're dealing with. So, again, with my spindle packages, one of the variables and I should say benefits that I offer all my clients is when you order a spindle from me, you get a one-year direct in-house replacement from me, from me direct. That means you don't go to anybody. 
That means you don't deal with hassles of, oh, God, I bought this overseas. You will pay more for me, but you're not getting that from anyone else. And I can tell you that for a fact because these vendors don't work that way. Okay, unless that spindle is dead, and I mean dead, usually DOA on arrival, you ain't getting that. They'll tell you it's warranted. Good luck in getting it. Very, very few times will you get it. You get a spindle that's bad, a bearings go. What you do is you purchase a spindle for me. I put you on my list as a client. If there's a problem with the spindle, send it back. Send it back. Once I get it back, as long as it's unmodified, and I know I have to say that, and it's silly, but I do say it because I have received some that for some reason guys feel that they want to modify, cut the end cap off, start butchering it. If I cannot be reimbursed, I cannot reimburse you. This is logical. You wouldn't go to Walmart and take apart the TV and then try to return it and then them open it up and see it and be shocked when they say no. So let's look at it logically. You buy the spindle. It doesn't work. You send it back the way you received it. I receive it that way. I'm reimbursed. You're reimbursed. Everybody's happy and you're protected. And that to me is peace of mind. I didn't think I have to explain business that way, but I do it now because I feel that there are some people out there that, that just don't understand this. I know in this field, it seems like more and more every day we go on YouTube and you see guys butchering a system or taking things apart. and You know, you wonder sometimes where people are thinking, I'm being explicit. Think about that. The breakdown that you see here for the spindle is exact. This is everything you would require to assemble your actual cables. You can see here I'm even bold printing. You will have to solder on the included spindle connector and ring connectors to attach the VFD's terminal block. 16.3 is required because you do need a power cable to run from the outlet that you'll be planning on using to power your VFD. We mitigate EMI at both ends. There's this misconception that you can use an unshielded cable powering your VFD. You should be mitigating EMI on both ends. It's just logical. It's balanced, guys. Okay. I have guys still ask me that. They're like shocked by it. Really? You need to use shit? Of course. Why would you not? That's the question. I mean, if you're, you're spending the money on the cable to do it from the actual power cable going from the VFD, you certainly would want to do it from the actual power cable going to the VFD. So, again, we look at that. Anything with a power cable going from the VFD to the spindle, she double shielded. It should be double shielded as well coming from the outlet to power your VFD. This is best practice. Again, Everything else here is not optional. It's a must. You need the ring connectors. You're going to require the heat shrink. And I, again, I give you the double wall heat shrink. I give you the single wall heat shrink to build the exact same cable that I do. Um, the big thing here, again, at your 20 collet set, I know China now, some of them include the, the uh, collet set, some don't. The other factor is shipping in the States, these spindles are heavy. And I mean like 14 pounds heavy. Just the spindle. That's not the whole package. So when you factor in the whole package and everything, we're looking at, you know, depending upon where it's going to, it can be pricey. So keep that in mind. But that one-year warranty, like I said, it can happen six months. It can happen nine months. You pick and choose when it happens, but you're covered. You're covered. So, and again, no runaround. Contact me. Vin, I'm going to send it back. Okay. Send it back. Boom. You'll get a new one. Now, that's one time. Okay. Once again, I told you I, I sign your name in. Once your name's on that list as a client, you get it one time. That's not, I can't do this, you know, every year. You would have to buy a new spindle the next following for that next purchase, and then we can do that again. I can re-up it again. But if you break that down, guys, that's that's an amazing warranty. Everybody else, they're going to want to analyze the spindle, take it apart. That'll take a couple weeks, see if the manufacturer wants to look at it. That'll take time. I don't have that. So keep that in mind. Again, make sure you're getting a spindle with ABEC rated bearings. If you're not getting ABEC rated bearings, you don't know what they're using. Um, a lot of them claim to be using German bearings, this, that, and the other thing. You want ABEC bearings. Um, just keep that in mind. Everything there has got to be in place. But overall, now you've seen the level of detail. And what's amazing is when I tell guys, you know, a consultation for this type of system is usually an hour. This video is now done in 58 minutes. And I've covered every amount of detail that I feel you guys need to understand. And if you guys are wanting to perform a retrofit on this system, you have all of the detail right here in your, in your education, so to speak, to actually go through, use this as a resource, and you'll know exactly what you need to know. Now, I realize that a video like this is going to raise a lot more questions. A lot of my videos do. I'm going to give you, again, in the beginning of the video, 
as well as the end. My contact information direct storm2313 at gmail.com. You can message me there for consultations, questions, whatever you need. Message me uh, quotes. The next thing is you can also message me through my eBay store. So either one of those contacts is fine. Um, again, if we're doing a 6040 retrofit, if we're doing a 6090 retrofit, any of these chassis, 30, 20, 30, 40, all of the Chinese chassis within that size, this essentially all goes for that. As a matter of fact, it'll probably go for many other chassis. However, the only variable would be the transmission. We're dealing with motor couplers, you're always going to be dealing with a ball screw transmission. You're typically not going to be dealing with a rack and pinion. So, again, that's the one variable. Other than that, you guys have learned a lot. I think I've made myself explicitly clear, and I hope it's helped many of you. Uh, to all my subscribers watching this hour video, if you watch it, I really do appreciate it. Thank you all for your support. Take care.